Hey, Internet. This episode of Worldview Everlasting is brought to you by the letter AWESOME. The numbers Sweet Action and Issues Etc. Talk Radio for the Thinking Christian. Issuesetc.org. We got a little bit of a lightweight show today because, well, I uh, got some stuff going on, friends coming into town and uh, kind of relaxed a little bit. But I want to make sure we certainly get out to you. But before we do, a real fast update on Philadelphia Lutheran Ministries and the work going on with your missionary to Philadelphia, Reverend Joshua Gale, who's been on the job now for a couple of months and things are going really well. If you're following on Facebook, the Philadelphia Lutheran Ministries page, remember you can always get updates and see what's going on, the things that are needed, things like socks and diapers and upcoming now winter clothing, especially for Reverend Gale to be able to hand out to poor people, homeless people living in the city and so forth. But I want to give a special shout out to those of you who have discovered on the PLM website, phillyministries.org, that you can now donate directly to the funding of this missionary effort with PayPal. Over the last month, some of you have been funding this and we've been getting some very good gifts, so kudos to you. And if you haven't yet decided to adopt this missionary activity as your missionary, be sure to go over there and check it out. It is amazing how inexpensive missionary work really could be when we focus on keeping missionary pastors alive in a region. It doesn't take mounds and mounds and millions and millions of dollars to make this happen. Congregations working together and individuals like you who want to go above and beyond their tithe to offer up this sacrifice of praise can make it possible for one man to go into a place where there is no presence of confessional Lutheranism or of pure law and gospel preaching and stay there and do work in the long term to bring the Word of God to people who aren't hearing. Yo, yo. For today, then, we head back to this Word of God with Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, flowing right out of last week's text, where Jesus' disciples, the twelve, having learned that the keys of the kingdom are going to be given to them so that they might loose things on earth and it'll be loosed in heaven and bind things on earth and it'll be bound in heaven that the church itself will have the power to forgive and retain sins and from which they learn that this comes through the death and resurrection of Jesus and his sign of Jonah for all time that three days and three nights he will be in the belly of the earth to come forth again and that he then goes and proves this with his transfiguration on the mount showing that he's got the son of God power to make it happen. Following all this it seems the disciples themselves these original pastors uh, aren't really having everything clear because they start arguing about which one of them gets to be the greatest in this coming kingdom, this new regime of the Son of Man on earth. To this, Jesus goes straight at the jugular, talking about the need for humiliation, the need to recognize one's own sin, to recognize the value of all sinners as people whom God created and who he has purchased with the blood of Christ. In this sense, even receiving an infant, a child, becomes cause for rejoicing in the kingdom of heaven, so that there is great joy over one sheep found when 99 have remained in the pasture, and that the entire Christian community will live and breathe and dwell around mutual forgiveness being given in its midst where two or three are gathered in the name of Christ that is baptized into Christ loving each other from the heart as God has first loved them out of this then Peter having heard Jesus say that you must forgive your brother which I think here we need to understand in the book of Matthew brother seems to be kind of Jesus way of talking about your neighbor the only time that Jesus uses the word neighbor in Matthew is when he is directly quoting the Old Testament but throughout Matthew there's a regular use of the word brother in two different ways. One is when it's talking about, you know, James and his brother John, literally. But the other way is talking about anybody who you might run into. Why do you take the speck out of your brother's eye when there is a log in your own, right? This is talking about your neighbor, the people who you meet in your various vocations that you have, who you have a duty to before God to serve with your vocation or through your vocation. So that when Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go to him and be reconciled. He means whoever might sin against you, let this forgiveness reign among you, especially to you who hold the office of the ministry by which you are proclaiming eternal forgiveness and bestowing it on behalf of the church over that church community. That this is ecclesiology for Christ's sake. Church theology for Christ's sake. Church theology from the forgiveness of that cross. So Peter hearing this, this whole idea about forgiving the brother, asks a very interesting question. Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and must I forgive him? That is, how many times should I forgive my brother when he comes to me? Repentant. As many as seven times? Now keep in mind that when he asks this question with this 
this number seven, it's really not a bad idea. I mean, seven is the number of holiness and sanctification. It's, it's, a, it's a special number in the Bible dealing with God's will. And so to take something up to seven times is really quite generous. I mean, how ready are you when someone sins against you the same way twice in the same week after he says, I'm sorry, and then does it again, or on the second time willing to even say, hey, yeah, I forgive you. Let's talk about our relationship and work on how we live together again. Getting to seven, I mean, that's quite a ways. Peter's not exactly, you know, off base, except that, especially as a pastor in the church, he's way off base. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven, which is difficult in the Greek to translate because we don't know if it means like 70 times seven, as in you're multiplying it to 490, or if it's just 70 times plus seven more, 77 times. Any way you spin it, the point is a bit hyperbolic, a bit exaggerated, as in beyond reason. We're going to see that a little bit more in the parable which follows, but the idea is that he's saying, I don't want you to keep track of how many times you forgive your brother. Every time that your neighbor comes to you in any way, shape, or form and seeks reconciliation, seeks pardon from you for what he has done against you and confesses this to you, there is no number too big to the number of times you can say, I forgive you. Notice this also, though. This is pretty important. It's going to come out in the parable as well. One of the key things about forgiveness is not a just a blanket, well, I forgive everyone, period. I walk around in total forgiveness to all and whatever you do to me, this is fine. Not exactly. We're not saying we don't recognize what sin is anymore. Grace is not a license to ignore God's will. Peter's question is, how many times when a brother comes to me, repentant, when he actually says, I am sorry for what I have done, shall I forgive him? Now again, don't hear this as a license to just spew hatred on anyone that doesn't repent. But keep in mind that within the church especially, repentance and forgiveness go together. Grace is not license. Grace is the bestowal of pardon upon those who have asked for it. Therefore, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven or the reign of God is like a certain king who wished to settle his accounts with his servants. So there's a ruler who's going to settle the books with the people who owe him stuff. Yeah, pretty normal thing there. But when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. Now, what does that mean? 10,000 talents? Well, back in the day, the talent initially meant a weight or a measure of about 25 kilograms. I don't know how to translate kilograms into pounds, but a pretty heavy amount of weight that eventually became a of money, which was substantial. I mean, this is an expensive amount of money. Long and short of it is that when you do the math, a man who owed 10,000 talents, working at a common day laborer rate of 100 denarii, would need to work for 600,000 days in order to pay off his debt. This is an exorbitant amount of money. More money than you or I will ever see in our lifetimes, most likely, unless, you know, you invent a new kind of supercomputer that runs on, you know, bacon and water or something. Yeah. <laughs> That said, he brings to him this man who owes him an insane amount of money. And because he could not pay this man, he didn't have the money to give to him. His master ordered him to be sold and his wife to be sold and his children to be sold in order to pay back at least some of the debt so that at least something would be made for it and that justice would be served to this man who had essentially stolen you know, a king's ransom. Now this might strike us as a little severe, but no, this is, this is really just justice. It also shows us how this was probably not playing on kind of standard Jewish ideas because in Jewish culture, according to the Levitical laws, you could not sell a man's wife or his children in order to pay his debts. He himself could be sold or could sell himself to pay his debts, knowing that he would be released from that debt in six years at the year of Jubilee on the seventh year. Hey, look at that. Holy number. <laughs> so here what we see happening is something rather extreme. I mean, this is like a pagan king bringing true pagan justice upon a man who really did deserve it. But the servant fell to his knees and began to implore him. Peson prosecune. Literally, falling, he began to kiss toward him. This is a word that eventually comes to mean something like worship or do reverence, but you have the initial idea of being face down on the ground, kissing the feet of the person in front of you. Well, that's not literally what happened, but that's the idea behind this. I mean, this is all out subjugation. He subjugated himself to this king and said, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. I will repay all of it. Now, here alone is something that is kind of weird. I mean, how is he going to pull that off? Uh, perhaps he's a governor of some kind, so he makes a whole lot more than 100 denarii a day. Maybe he makes a talent every month, but I mean, he's still looking at 10,000 months to pay it off with no living on it and stuff. The point being is that his claim here is a little silly, really. He's trying to pay back something that can't be paid. He does say, have patience, which is good. You know, don't, don't attack me entirely, but his, his boast is somewhat of a boast. It's a bit like a 
sinful human being, one who has become evil by our own inherited choice to be evil, having the entire decline and wickedness of the world upon our shoulders and saying, you know, hey God, just, you know, give me a few more, you know, years of life and, and I'll justify myself. That's effectively what he's doing. Now here's the amazing thing is that this king doesn't respond to this insane statement either with some kind of, oh, you idiot, what kind of fool are you? You'll never pay this back off with him. Rather, splonchnisthes, related to the word spleen, which was the seat of emotions in Greek thought, his spleen and internal guts poured out from himself upon this man. That is to say, he had mercy on him. He sees him in his pitiable state, having totally lied to himself and lied to others, making claims he can never claim, saying, I shall justify myself eventually. And rather than giving him the full repayment for evil that he deserves, he has mercy on him. Crazy that. And so he released him from the debt and forgave him everything entirely. He didn't even say, you know, pay back some of it. He just said, it's gone. It's wiped clean. The slate is empty. You are free. I mean, wows. This is the grace of God which has been poured out into the world in the death and resurrection of Jesus where the Lord set aside the legal demands of his design of creation as well as the legal demands of the covenant given to the Israelites. He set it all aside, nailing it to the cross in the flesh of Christ, buying complete and total pardon from all evil ever. Sweet action this. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Hey, wait, that's a day's wage. It's not a small amount of money, but it's not 10,000 talents. You know, it's 150 bucks. And seizing him, he began to choke him. I mean, this is a little rough. He didn't even get treated this bad by his master. He said, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, peson, same word, fell to the ground and pleaded with him. Slight difference in language here though. He doesn't kiss his feet, worship reverence, absolutely subjugate himself, but nonetheless, he begs him. He does as much as a fellow servant can do. And with almost identical words, he says, have patience with me and I will pay what you owe. The only word missing there is I will pay all. But see, it's implied he's going to. It's just what he's going to pay is actually quite feasible. He could actually repay this debt. This is not the debt of a sinner to an angry God. This is the debt of a sinner to another sinner. Completely able to be done. I'm sorry. I'll bring justice to you. But the original servant willed it not. Desire it not, wanted to give no mercy. This guy was looking for more than justice. He was looking for some kind of payback. And he went and he threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. Now the parallel and the diversity between these two pieces is rather extreme. On the one hand, you have absolute total mercy that's undeserved. On the other hand, you have an overabundance of wrath that is undeserved, almost an unreasonable anger. Now when the other fellow servants saw this, these things that had happened, they were greatly disturbed by it. And you know, rightly so. And they went and reported to their master all these things that had taken place. So the master summoned the original man and said to him, Dule pone servant, evil one, truly. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant? Just as I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the torturers, sometimes translated as jailers, but really carrying with it more than just kind of a prison where there's air conditioning and three square meals a day. I mean, he's, he's gonna suffer for this until he should pay all his debt, which is never. Thus ends the parable, and then Jesus turns and fixes his 12 disciples, these whom he will send to preach forgiveness, baptize, and teach the world, fixes them with an eye and says, So also my heavenly Father will do to you, all of you, if you, individually, do not forgive your brother from your heart. Whoa. Interestingly enough, one of the 12 standing there is going to see this happen as he betrays the Son of Man to his death. All the more, though, we should recognize this is kind of where the Lutheran understanding of single predestination, you know, it really makes a lot of sense. It's not like these men aren't saved or will never have faith, but there's the warning that one can take the Christianity they've been given, take the total forgiveness of their debt, which they've received in Christ, and turn their back on it by hating their neighbor without just cause, given the context. Kind of a terrifying thing. All the more so for these who are then pastors in the church to take these keys which have been given to the church for the sake of the church and having been given them to use them, not use them, just because, well, of a personal grudge or because they've decided that they get to decide now when repentance has an end. Remember, this is not in the context of forgiving those who don't want forgiveness. This is the context of in both situations you had men who knew what they had done was wrong and are saying please forgive me. This is the purpose of the keys that Jesus has given to the church. It's the purpose of the office of the ministry to be there to publicly proclaim absolution upon every and all sinners who confess their sin. And so rightly so it is a condemnation especially to a pastor who would not exercise these keys but instead presume to judge for himself whether or not a heart is repentant. All the more so does this overflow 
flow into the life of all Christians who, being forgiven all things by Christ, would not reconcile with their brother, with their neighbor, over any trifling issue. Now, we got to catch on here at the end, though, this idea of forgiving from the heart and kind of weed it through the rather Americanized from the heart always means emotion. That's not really what's going on here. Forgiveness is a decision to repeal wrath, not a decision to kind of have gushy, warm feelings and love. So we should understand the from the heart here, meaning not that you emotively want to forgive, because as a sinner, you're not going to, but that you act as if you make it from the heart a reality, that the world would see that what you have done is forgiveness, what you have done is absolved, that your neighbor, your brother would actually see and feel from you, not what they deserve, but far less than that. With that, interestingly enough, the desire of mercy probably will grow in the Christian the more they are, you are, receiving forgiveness in word and sacrament. So there will be times when you are glad to forgive, where you are released yourself from the burden of judgment by the ability to absolve. But don't get caught up in this hyper-evangelical, I've got to perfectly forgive my neighbor thing. What are you trying to do? Justify yourself before God based on how good you are at forgiving? That is not the purpose of this parable. The whole parable itself flows from the proclamation that you are forgiven in Christ, that his cross is enough for you. Ergo, even when you feel like not forgiven, remember what your brother needs. He needs your forgiveness. He needs Christ's forgiveness. He needs you to point him to the place where he can receive forgiveness with you, both sinners kneeling at that table, being fed. Here, take eat. I forgive you. Yo? Yo. Interestingly enough, right out of this text is going to flow some teaching about divorce. Talk about a place where there's no forgiveness, huh? I'm talking de jura humano, between man and woman. And based on the teaching that Jesus gives on divorce, his disciples will actually respond, wow, it's better not to get married. Who can ever do that? But Jesus has got a point he's driving to, and it's the same point he made back when he put that little child in their midst and said, the greatest one is the weak one who can do nothing and must be forgiven. For immediately after saying, this teaching about marriage and how difficult it is must also be received by faith, he then begins to welcome little children to him that he might bless them. The disciples don't like this either, and he says, hey guys, aren't you ever going to get this? Let the little children come to me, for of such is the reign of God. The reign of God has come for those who can do nothing, who can achieve nothing. They can't forgive their neighbor from the ushy-gushy, warm-themed happinesses of their heart. They cannot pay back the debt that they owe to God. They must, in fact, be saved from it. And ho, 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 thanks be to God, that is what Jesus has done, does, and will continue to do for you. Mm -hmm. This has been your Lightweight Worldview Everlasting Greek Tuesday. We'll catch you next time. Cool. Rock on. <laughs>